It's Friday, Feedback Friday, the feedbackiest day of the week. Uh, it's Feedback Friday. And sorry, I'm really freaking punchy right now. Um, Thursday was a really long day of media. Um, it started in the morning with a radio interview that was very weird. Um, and then finished with uh, uh, us appearing in studio on CBC Radio, and uh, it was a really good experience, but CBC Radio is so intimidating, because the way you go in, everybody's whispering, CBC Radio, you have to speak like this, and so try to be funny in this room that, like, sucks all the sound out is really, really hard, uh, but uh, there's lots of feedback to get to. Oh, wow, like, the... The sheer number of comments this week is a little bit daunting, so forgive me. I want to start with a, a correction. I realized based on a tweet I got from somebody that in, in my attempts to make it really clear just how different Canada's political system is from the American one, I said something that's potentially misleading. Um, I said that, you know, the, the cabinet ministers are like, you know, a Senate subcommittee head, a Congr congressional subcommittee head, and, and, and you know, like a, a secretary combined. And somebody said, but aren't there parliamentary committees? And yes, there are. Um, they just don't tend to make the news a lot. So I wanted to be clear, a parliamentary committee, the closest thing to it are the congressional committees. So what I probably should have said is it was a combination of a Senate committee and and a, uh, a secretary in, in the U.S. system, because yes, there are um, parliamentary committees. Um, they, they just, you know, they don't have the the power of, say, the Senate Intelligence Committee or the Ways and Means Committee or something like that, which are sort of the the potential jumping off points to a presidential run someday. You know, you want to be on the Foreign Affairs Committee. You want to be on, on some of these powerful committees. It don't work that way in Canadian politics. But uh, people were, I, I was, I was, um, shouldn't say pleasantly surprised because I know you guys are awesome. Uh, but the, the comments for, everything this week i will say we're great uh let's just start at butts gate because you know it i i started there so i'm gonna start there um people had had opinions on it one person and and you guys know i love history so i loved the uh the comment someone made that they um uh, pointed out that the Canadian system was a reaction to the U.S. system's failures, I'm just reading, to hold cabinet to account in the U.S. Civil War. Um, Canada kept the queen, so when U.S. hawks declared war on, essentially, Canada's upper and lower Canada, uh, they would automatically declare war on the British Empire. Now, they pointed out that the attorney general is the chief law officer to the crown, meaning the Queen of England, and this commenter said, as such, must be in cabinet. Um, I'm not sure it must be. It is. But this kind of stuff could be amended. I mean, the governor general is actually the highest ranking person in our government because they're the envoy of the queen. Now, this is a this is a figurehead position at this point. So we, we could decide to change that. But they also pointed out, and I, I'm not sure I made this clear, so I think this is valid, that the um, judicial system is separate in Canada and judges aren't allowed to have a political party affiliation. So the way the Supreme Court works in the U.S. where it's like, oh, we conservative judges or liberal judges, the, the politics of our Supreme Court judges are far less known. We don't have elected law enforcement like elected sheriffs. You know, we don't we don't have elected judges anywhere um so this is just an ongoing thing i got a lot of actually facebook stuff from um colleagues of mine in america saying good for you for differentiating uh so that was cool uh i don't do a lot of canadian stuff because my audience is primarily american but so that was that was really cool and 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 go ahead and and read the comments there's a lot of interesting stuff in there that whole uh, touching on a scandal didn't go to shit the way I was afraid. Oh, sorry, Kate. Uh, I'm really trying not to swear, 
for two reasons that it slips out. One is there's a, a absolutely lovely woman who um, found my content through Boogie298's channel. Her name's Kate and she's kind of a conservative Christian and swearing is an issue for her when she wants to share with her friends. So I'm trying to keep the swearing down because she's she's an absolute doll. And then I found out that a guy is uh, he's this parent of this super awesome uh, budding gamer girl. Um, she's nine years old. And sometimes he doesn't know how to explain something to her. So he lets her watch my videos. And I'm like, oh, my God, all these cool people who have, you know, there are reasons not to swear. I'm going to have to watch the swears. Also, welcome to those uh, coming in from Classic Gamers Guild this week. It's a Facebook group. It's a closed group. So you kind of have to apply if you're a fan of like the old like King's Quest, Quest for Glory, the stuff I do on Twitch. Um, I'm Red Leanna K on Twitch every Tuesday at 6 p.m. Eastern. Uh, and I, I do cl uh, classic adventure games or classic adventure style games. Um, and a lot of the referrals I've been getting, like I did Thimbleweed Park this week, that came from this group. They're a great, an absolutely great group of people. It reminds me of all the awesome, amazing, very good parts of gaming, the same way you guys do in the comments. Um, but we have this thing called ladies night, which is just basically poop posting. You know what I mean uh, about that um, on a theme. And last Friday, the theme was red dwarf. I, this is really inside. I know. Um, but they mad libbed a song that was in an episode of red dwarf. And it kind of took off because, you know, Danny John Jules is awesome. Um, it's a song called tongue tied. And there was a music video for it, and they were playing it on the orchards. It was a big deal in Britain. And so they mad-libbed it. And so I recorded, you know, you know, I do the, the parody songs with um, Mar Mouse Mary Jest. And so I, I recorded this right in my wheelhouse, uh, sang four-part backup vocals on it, made a music video, everything was crazy. And so the mods liked it, and they posted it. So now there's people watching my content from Classic Gamers Guild. Um, welcome. You guys will probably like my Twitch content more than my YouTube comment content because I, I touch on retro games nearly exclusively there, though I'm really tempted to play Metro one week. Um, but uh, uh, that moves me into the Anthem discussion. And man, the comments... You guys were awesome in these comments because... There was so much love for classic Bioware, for old Bioware. Um, and yet there was so much sadness for what's going on. And uh, it was like a wake in the comments for that reason. But I hope some people at Bioware read the comments and see how much residual goodwill there is for the company and, and how... Many people are still out there waiting, like, just give us, like, like I said in the video, just make another version of Dragon Age Origins and we will be happy. Now, as one person pointed out in the comments, you know, after Dragon Age Origins, there was kind of some financial issues with Bioware, um, and, and, um, yeah, they have to do what they have to do to keep afloat, but... <sighs> I'm 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 really really hoping that Dragon Age Four is gonna bring the magic back, and I admit that I am I am fan fictioning what I would do with Dragon Age Four, and I think I should share just because this is so freaking nerdy. This is how much I think about these things, uh, and I know you guys will love it because like you're old Bioware fans. Um, now I suspect Dragon Age Four is gonna be more about the you know, the, the old ancient elf gods because of the way... I haven't played Trespasser yet. Uh, is it good? Let me know if it's good. Uh, oh, the other thing I want to know, guys, is if there's a really great comment, should I say the commenter's name? I kept comments anonymous for people, but if it's like it's positive, if I'm, if I'm, if I'm you know, giving somebody a, a bit of pushback, I'm not going to say the name. But if it's positive, should I say the name? Let me know. Um, but uh, so what I would do for Dragon Age 4 is play as a character living 
in one of the Canary occupied areas, you know, the, those, those places as they sort of touched on an inquisition, um, where there are other races living under the Kyun. And what I would, it would sort of be a combo of all three games in that there's like a, you know how in, in two and three, there was always this mages and Templars kind of split somewhere. Well, in this case, it would be, do you become a rebel against the, the Kunari occupation and work to overthrow the, 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 the Kunari? Or do you become a devout follower of Kyun and basically join the Kunari and rise up through their ranks? Because the one thing I have been desperate for, because the comics did this and it was really cool, but we have never seen inside Kunari culture in a Dragon Age game. The closest we got was the dealings with the Arashok in Dragon Age 2. And that was my favorite part of Dragon Age 2, other than, than Varric. I liked Varric a lot. Um, and, and the way they sort of... Um, Fenris, my first playthrough, I didn't appreciate. Um, Fenris, my second playthrough, I really got. And I got his anger, and I got the subtext behind his anger. And I give Bioware massive credit for putting a... A male victim of sexual assault in their game. But yeah, that's what I would do for Dragon Age 4 is I would create this because it's so topical, right? And yet at the same time, you're not shoving politics down people's throats because it's actually something in game and you'd actually get to role play. You'd have to either like throw off this culture, say, no, I completely disagree. Or you'd have to learn to work within the confines of the culture to rise up through the ranks and become like this big canary. And I mean, there's so many branches, right? What part do you play in the rebellion? What part would you play in, in the canary structure? Because the canary believe that, you know, you're all just sort of a limb. There's the heart, there's the head, there's the sword, you know, which branch it, it could branch in wonderful places. And you could replay the game like, Eight different times and, and never have the same experience. That's my idea for Dragon Age 4. It probably won't happen based on how Inquisition ended. Um, but that's my idea because I'm a big nerd. Uh, I'm not going to like read the sadness. Um, but uh, uh, that that's where I'm going with those with those uh, comments. People people did say in the comments that they didn't get the Krogan lecturing on the environment that happened for me and I believe it was the first the first planet where you get to set up a little colony and you have to go out and you have a choice whether to scan for water or scan for oil you have to pick the resource and everybody's chirping in your ear giving you advice and a Krogan starts going on, basically pushing like the water option, like, oh, you don't want to wreck the planet. And that's what I was like, I'm done. I, I can't. I can't do this. Um, so moving on. Uh, oh, I don't know whether to do which Mortal Kombat video to do, because sort of Monday's video inspired Tuesday's video because it was too much for one video. Um, I want to read this one comment from the Monday video about, you know, I called it on the covering up of female Mortal Kombat characters because it got a lot of positive response from other commenters, like significantly. Um, uh, one, one person commented on the fact that Scarlet's redesign feels forced. That got like 42 thumbs up. So that that's fair to mention as well. I'm... Uh, I'm not willing to say so yet. I've noticed that, and you see it with Jade too, I'm noticing almost like a Bedouin theme to some of these costumes. And I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if that's because, um, oh God, I forget which setting. Uh, it's not, the, it was Earth Realm, Nether Realm, Intense. They're focusing on Outworld. I could be wrong, but I think that has something to do with the setting. I think uh, uh, the fact that they're all sort of dressed for the desert is going to be relevant. 
And so, yeah, I, I'm sure it will be explained. I, I really don't get the sense that the Mortal Kombat guys are, are just, you know, we're going to put everyone in cloaks. Um, I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm giving them the opportunity to, to explain why everybody's in a cloak. Maybe it's just so clothes can fly off while they're fighting. I don't know. We'll find out. Uh, but this other comment was, it got a lot of discussion as well as thumbs up. So what it was, I am of two opinions on this. On the one hand, I noticed the increasing sexiness of the female characters during the MK3, UMK3 trilogy era. Absolutely factual. Shiva debuted in MK3 and she's the most daring and sexually provocative outfit from an objective perspective. She wears little more than a sling bikini that serves as just barely sensor bars for the lady bits. On the other hand, how sexy an outfit is depends on the character. Despite her revealing outfit, I never really considered Shiva sexy. She always represented power in my mind. My understanding of her relative nudity is the same mindset I have for Goro and Kintaro. Kintaro, extremely underrated character. Sorry, that was my comment, not this commenter's. They have very muscular bodies and showing skin as a display of strength in her case, like with bodybuilders. Pro bodybuilders don't wear those skimpy undies to turn on the audience. They wear to display their muscles. It's actually very non-sexual, at least to me. Spot on, yes, um... Uh, Shiva's costume was very, or lack thereof, was very much evocative of female bodybuilders at the time, which was becoming this sort of new trend that, that Mortal Kombat, you know, fitness modeling, figure modeling, all that stuff. Absolutely spot on. Uh, again, me, my, my, my side, not the commenters. All I ask for for any character are designs that are cool and make sense for the character's personality and narrative. Sonya in a sexy cop outfit bugs me because it doesn't fit her characterization. Melina in scraps doesn't bother me because being over-sexualized actually plays into her personality and rival with Katana. Again, spot on. Uh, that was me. As for Jade, I guess I'm just indifferent. The armor makes me think of Reptile instead of Jade. I think that's my biggest complaint. I don't recognize her off the bat. And that was the part I'm like, huh? Hmm, because uh, Jade and Reptile are always linked in my mind to sort of hidden characters. Um, I, I'm such an old school Mortal Kombat fan for that reason. And perhaps that's why I, that, that connection didn't bother me. But you're right. Um, other people sort of touched on in the and you can you can read the comments that spawned. But I just wanted to give massive kudos for that comment because it spawned a lot of really great discussion. Um, but. Uh, w some of the stuff in the comments, one person said that I, I just wanted to go back to looking vaguely like Janet Jackson and like, maybe like, yeah, maybe I do kind of feel sad that the one, like it, it was like Jade and Tanya before, uh, Jackie Briggs who were, um, non-white women who were like human in the Mortal Kombat universe and, now she's got kind of gray skin. And I guess, yeah, that's a little bit just because because I admit like, yeah, that that Jade from back in the day, pretty sexy. And, and I'm, not, I'm saying this just to like, you know, thirsty this up. It, it was a big deal at the time. And, and it just sort of happened because gamers are awesome and they don't overcomplicate this stuff. But it, it was a big deal that any medium and this is why I say gaming is actually way ahead in terms of 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 progress. I won't say progressive thought because that sounds too, you know what I mean? But uh, the idea of a a a black woman as being beautiful and and sexy and someone that is going to appeal to a presumably predominantly white audience, that was a big deal. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, up until very recently. <laughs> Uh, you know, even when the culture wars and gaming got going in 2012, that was, that was a big deal. So uh, Mortal Kombat deserves credit for giving its player base credit for, you know, giving them women of, uh, you know, women of different races assumed to be beautiful, assumed to be desirable. That's not nothing. And I want to give them that. So going on to the last video about cultural gatekeeping video games. This one, yes, I think we finally have understanding. People are finally understanding me. Yay, that was the purpose of the video. Um, the same commenter. Again, this is like the commenter of the week. I'm going to say first name. Commenter's name is Gene. Commenter of the week, man. Like Gene owned it. Just nailed it. Every freaking video. Um, but... 
Jean said in this one, and, and this is about cultural gatekeeping in videos and for people who didn't video games, for people who didn't see the video, it was me pointing out that, you know, Anita Sarkeesian didn't become a fairly dominant voice on her own. People, predominantly male people in video games had to accept her and, and give her that dominant status because, you know, one person can't just come in and go, hey guys, I'm in charge now. That has to be granted. And so what Jean said in response was, I think that Anita was able to get in because gaming was eager to show the outside world that it wasn't a boys club, like many critics, including Anita, claimed. I don't think that gaming companies were thinking, oh, women won't play, women don't play games, let's embrace this toxic lying narrative. I think they jumped at the chance to show a critic that they weren't the he-man women haters others saw them as. Anita used the goodwill of gamers to shame them. That's why the responses to her were so heated. Many gamers, myself included, felt attacked. That's also why so many of the response videos to her highlighted the beloved female characters in gaming. We were trying to protect ourselves from false allegations of sexism. Sadly, Anita was able to take the vitriol she stirred up and sell the mainstream who want to believe that gamers are anti-women, a narrative they wanted to hear, that the big, bag, angry, meanie gamer boys were as bad as everyone says they were. Look at how they were treated little old defenseless me for having a critical opinion. When we tried to defend ourselves, we were ignored and worse, shamed and betrayed by the very games press that was supposed to represent and speak for us. Um, I want to add a little perspective just from the inside there. Amazing comment. A huge amount of truth there. I didn't stop and agree because I, I didn't want to be quite so fragmented a second time. As somebody who was working in games 2010 to circa 2013 when Tropes vs. Women was really getting going, um, I just sort of a timeline. I started covering video games around, I believe, 2007. I was still doing Ed and Red's Night Party, and I was I was including games in that show. Um, so it was early, early to mid 2000s. That's when I started doing gaming content. Um, and uh, around when Halo 3 came out, whenever that was, slight, somewhat before that, Bioshock, Halo 3, those were the sort of games. Um, so as someone working in games, I did at the time get a lot of, you don't, you don't really play this stuff. You don't, you don't really like this stuff, right? Right? The question I used to get was, who got you into games? And the correct answer in their minds were, was some male. They were expecting me to say, my brother a boyfriend, something like that, when I said, well, my mom held me up to the Pac-Man arcade machine when I was three, you saw that it broke their brains. Um, so there was a contingent, and, and this is, remember, this was at press events. These were other members of the press asking me these questions. So there was a contingent of them that actually thought, Oh, women don't play games. And it's not let's embrace this toxic lying narrative. It was the presumption that women wouldn't find something like in games as they were. That games would have to change significantly to attract a female audience. And I was like, what are you talking about? Pac-Man, Centipede, Quest for Glory, King's Quest. Those are the franchises other than, you know, Space Invaders and Missile Command and Wizard of War that sort of made me a gamer, not just somebody who played games, but somebody who made me a gamer. And what do um, Pac-Man, Centipede, Quest for Glory and, and uh, King's Quest all have in common? Well, Pac-Man was a game designed for women. Uh, Centipede was a game designed for women by, uh, you know, a female co-developer. Um, King's Quest and Quest for Glory both had female creators. So as far as I was concerned, gaming did not have to change. We just had to play up those strengths. And you notice the time frame, I'm talking like late original Xbox, early Xbox 360 era. Um, gaming was changing at that point to be that sort of dude bro audience because if you watch lady bits xbox was actively trying to pull the culture towards there because they they wanted to dominate that consumer base they didn't think they could get the pre-existing gamers so they they created a culture an artificial culture 
to appeal to basically frat boys. Um, and that worked for a console generation at, at a half. The original Xbox built it with, with Halo and then the 360, you know, that was the golden age of the Dubro gamer. Um, it's now falling off a lot. Now, my theory is not that, well, that means games are changing. My theory is that one console cycle is not the norm. One and a half-ish console cycles is an anomaly. If you look at the Atari cycle, the Nintendo cycle, the PlayStation 1 cycle, the PS2 cycle, the PS4 cycle, and now we're just talking consoles. We're not even getting into PC gaming. Um, you know, the, the golden age of adventure games ran from, oh God, I'm blanking on that Hero U epitaph. It's like 83 to 90 something, 97. That was a good long run. Um, you know, 14 years, that's a hell of a dynasty. And now they're coming back. That was the norm in gaming. That, if you look at all the years in gaming, you know, Atari being a family console, Nintendo being a family console, the PS1 being like Tomb Raider. Tomb Raider was the killer app on the PS1, or at least one of them. The PS2 had a, a massive diversity in games. And we're talking, that's when, you know, the the... the um, God, it, it started uh, pre-PS1, but it sort of moved over because uh, that the, the CD-based games is when I was playing things like um, Tekken and Dead or Alive, right? Um, so, you know, the fighting games with tons of female characters, that was going on. Uh, it was only, you know, a period of five to ten years where that changed. And now we're back to that. I mean, games like, you know, Horizon Zero Dawn are kicking ass and, you know, um, the, the the action adventure style game now is sort of open world, but there's still, you know, like third person games like um, the Spider-Man PS4 game, which is a ton of fun, by the way. I'm playing that right now when I have the time, which isn't much, unfortunately, but this is the norm. When it's a, a wide range of types of gamers, where there's something for everyone. Uh, I really see the, the first person shooter era as kind of a dark, dark time in gaming. And, and because that's when gaming kind of went mainstream, which maybe we sort of owe to first person shooters. I don't know. Maybe we can say that. Maybe we can say it's mobile gaming. But um, people think that's the norm. People think that exception to the rule is the norm, and it's not. First-person shooters w would not have had a chance to thrive were it not for arcade games and side-scroller action games and uh, RPGs and, and text parser and point-and-click adventure games. All those things had long, long runs before first person games. It was just Doom was super awesome. Everybody wanted to play Doom. It was like this great visceral thrill. Um, people got it backwards. And I feel very strongly about this just because I'm fortunate enough to be old enough to have seen it all happen. I've been around long enough to actually be a witness to gaming history. I'm not somebody who... Um, you know, it is just, oh, I read about this game or I went back and played it on GOG. I played King's Quest on a Tandy 1000 with a monochrome green screen. It was one, I got one of the old floppy drives back there. Just remember how freaking big and, and yuck they were. Um, I played Carmen Sandiego on an Apple IIe. I got the Apple IIc back there. Um... Uh, really cool adventure games on, on those computers too. That's gaming to me. And it's not that shooters don't have their place. I love my shooters. You guys know I love my shooters. But to treat shooters as the norm and everything else as an aberration, that's just not historically accurate. And I think that's why I feel so strong about these things, not just because I want gaming to validate me, but because it's just wrong. The idea that shooters are the norm historically in gaming is just wrong. And that matters. And so it's not just about, I want gaming to reflect me because you guys really know I don't need that. I'm freaking Kratos in my head, right? Um, 
but uh, I just want the facts. I want the facts to carry the day because I, I believe in gaming and I believe in gamers enough that when we finally start dealing with facts, as I've said on numerous radio interviews, gamers are good people. You guys are good people. And I'm going to leave you with that because that's a good place to wrap and this is getting long. So you know what's coming. Help support this channel. Become a monthly patron. Patreon.com slash Leanna K. It really helps a lot. I'd really appreciate the support. Thanks for watching.